So next talk up is UFOs and government. So let's, let's give him a big hand. Come on. Thank you. Okay. 18 years of DEF CON. It's a long time. <laughs> and you're supposed to do the politician thing like, oh, hi. Hi, Mark. You know, and <laughs> no babies here. They're DEF CON kids. Uh, this talk is going to be tweaked for the DEF CON context because I want it to be uh, not only what it is, and I am completely out of the closet now on the subject of ufology. You had to be careful along the way. The, there was once a reporter, columnist of the Washington Post, who called me up and said, what are the companies you've worked for? I love reading your stuff. And I told him some of the bigger names, you know, the ones you float. And then the column appeared and it was really kind of about how crazy can you be before companies like this will stop hiring you? <laughs> Uh, this could have a powerful impact on your career and your life when all you have is your word and your, repu your reputation. So I met him in Washington, we had lunch, and uh, we discussed the implications of that, and uh, he had gone over the line a little bit by misinterpreting something I wrote about ufology and about a friend at NSA, who I had quoted directly without approving what he said as accurate. He had said, they're here, they're here. Now our task, he said, is to figure out how they got here. And then he starts speculating, and I said these were speculations, and that's what was reported as if I had said it was fact. Uh, we don't know. We don't even know what they means, and this book, UFOs and Government, A Historical Inquiry, is in fact not primarily about aliens or crop circles or abductions or any of the craziness that you have blended truth, half-truth, and flat-out lies on cable TV and in the whole UFO domain of myth and mythology, what it's about primarily is the second word, government. It's about how the government responded to a phenomena which compelled them to respond by its ineluctable manifestation in their faces and the reports from credible people beginning in World War II, which is when we kind of mark the modern era because there had been reports uh, many years prior to that and in the last century that sound is suspiciously like UFO reports did in the middle of the 20th century and forward. But we could no longer ignore them because of the military imperative and as I will try to, sh to show in an adumbrated or brief way, uh, the national security concerns that the phenomena raised for them after World War II when the national security state was in fact uh, just beginning. Uh, the OSS migrating into CIA and, and many other instantiations and the kind of world in which we live, which is now getting some publicity because of the Snowden affair, as we call it, uh, is the world that was really beginning then and how the government responded to the phenomena, set policies, deliberated, argued, competed within its many different parts because there's no one government. There was CIA and there was Navy and there was Air Force and there was the executive branch and the White House and all kinds of competing points of view trying to deal with this thing which challenged people in a complex and puzzling way and above all would not go away. So they had to respond and the way they would, would choose to respond you will see even though I can only hit the highlights because our, our book is uh, 600 pages and it has nearly 1,000 citations in it it is the only book on the subject recommended by the journal Choice, which does that, for all academic and university libraries because it is an exception to the dreary field, which is not as painstaking, as rigorous, as academically solid as this team effort was, which took five years to create. And I'll say a little bit more about that. But you will see that what was said about the phenomena was very similar to what Clapper said to Congress uh, a few weeks ago under questioning when asked if we vacuumed up or collected the communications of the American people. And he said no, and when he was accused of lying, he did not admit that he had lied. He said that he had told the least untruthful thing he could say in public. And <laughs> that's what happens to the weasel words of the English language as they are used and misused 
and intentionally used for deception and disinformation. The fact is he lied. Uh, by normal human standards, those of us who live out here, we outsiders out here, some of you are insiders, so you know more intimately what I mean, but you can't say that you do, so you will act like outsiders out here for the purposes of this talk. All right? So let's get to it. First of all, I want to acknowledge, too, that DEF CON has shifted in the 18 years I've been coming and speaking here. Uh, there were a few hundred. The first time there are, I don't know, 14, 15,000 probably uh, this time. But what I noticed when they asked in the other packed room, how many are here for the first time, an awful lot of hands went up. And how many were here more than a few, five years? Not, not very many. And that means the context that I take for granted, because I am a silverback. I can't hide that either. I'm out of the closet as a deranged old man wandering around the con, as somebody tweeted just two years ago during one of my talks. <laughs> but he did add, nevertheless, he's still betting out, belting out some pretty heavy ideas, which I appreciated, despite the dementia, which was obviously in evidence. <laughs> the part of the brain that was functional was still somehow able to ideate, and I thanked him for that, but it is the marker. Two years after I started here, a reporter in England said I was a father figure for online culture. Ten years later, hackers said, change that to grandfather figure. And then ten years later, I'm a deranged old man. So <laughs> those of you who find that amusing, uh, that will be your destiny as well. I just warn you <laughs> in advance. It is an ineluctable pathway, and those dots will also connect for you. Okay, so let me establish the context. I used to refer to books, and then I found out that nobody read them anymore, so I started going to movies. And when a hacker here, when I referred to Hal, and a hacker came up and said, who is Hal? I realized I couldn't use even 2001. That's a movie by Stanley Kubrick uh, as a point of reference, because not enough people had seen it. And when I was driving a young man over here from the hotel this morning, I asked him how he liked Vegas, and it was his first trip, and he said, I don't know how Vegas got here. Uh, what, how did this town get built? And I said, do you not know anything about the history of Vegas? And he said, no. So all I could think of was movies. See Bugsy, Casino, and then read Kitty Kelly's biography of Frank Sinatra. And you got the whole, whole thing. But see Casino. Only the names have been changed to protect the guilty. Uh, and in this talk, see Chinatown. If you don't know the great flowering of golden Hollywood movies in the 1970s, look it up on Wikipedia it will be mostly accurate. And one of the movies that will be celebrated is Chinatown, uh, Robert Town's great opus, and look at how the end that they wanted to change it to was rejected because it was not real. A Chinatown moment is that kind of moment that you have when you realize, has that package been inspected? <laughs> <laughs> At my age, it goes too quickly to the brain. I better, better not. But, but thank you for offering. I appreciate it. Okay, let's get into the talk. Chinatown moments are moments when you realize things are not what they seem. They really are not what you thought they were. Uh, you may think you know what you're dealing with, Mr. Giddis said Noah Cross, the embodiment of evil, but believe me, sir, you don't. And there are moments, and this is the silverback part, as I have aged, where you wander into those zones of shadow and annihilation of the belief system you have built, which is a more optimistic one about how things actually work. Uh, that, for example, Snowden's sacrifice of his life, as it will turn out to be, perhaps. I don't mean he'll be killed, you don't need to kill people. My good friend Gary Webb took his own life when his reputation, credibility, and career were destroyed when he wrote an article about the CIA's Contra and crack cocaine that was in the main 98% correct, but which he was forced to retract. That is, his editor retracted it and he was fired. A Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, 10 years later, the word was, well, of course, we did a lot of that. Because the longer you get from the deed, the less accountability there is. So Congress will adjourn. There can be headlines today, and Congress will adjourn, and they'll come back in five or six weeks, and there will be some other issue on the burner, and not all that much will change. People in power just wait it out. Just wait it out. And freedom of speech is a bleeder valve 
to enable us to believe that we are having an effective response to the things that so perplex us. But when that speech becomes actionable, that's when you better look out. That's when you become a whistleblower uh, or a traitor. All right, that's relevant as the context in which this deception and disinformation project took place. UFOs and government is above all a historical inquiry. It is a work of history. It looks at how the government responded from the 1940s forward. Michael Swords was the lead writer. Michael is a brilliant man who's been writing really good scholarship about this subject, a professor of Western Michigan University, PhD in the history of technology and science. He's written great quality articles to show it is respectable, so to do, in this field. Uh, Michael was the lead writer. I was invited to join this project, I think, by a wing and a prayer. It's just the details don't matter, but I found myself in the group that thought it was going to plan some white papers and wound up planning this entire book, and it took five years to put the book together. After we met, we didn't meet again uh, until the book was complete. It was all done over the Internet. Chapters would go to and fro. There's no chapter allowed to this one or that one. We all participated in the creation of this 600-page historical record. The top three names you see, Claus, Vincente, and Bill, are experts in their own countries. Claus in Sweden, Vincente in Spain, and Bill in Australia, where they have been for many decades. Barry Greenwood pioneered in the use of Freedom of Information Act to get documents from the government that he claimed did not exist and which did exist. He did that in the 70s when he had a chance. He knew in 1980 when Reagan was elected that that was the end of FOIA, as in fact it is. I've had friends both at FBI and Interpol tell me, well, you're never going to get what you request because we file it under different names in other file folders so we can tell you honestly there's nothing in that file uh, because it's cross-referenced under different codes. So it's not going to work the same way anymore and also you'd be charged, what, 10 bucks a page to duplicate 8,000 pages. Uh, I was included uh, by sheer good fortune. Jan Aldrich is the head of Project 1947, which you can find on the web with an awful lot of documentation, former Army intelligence man who kept us honest. If you look at the book, there will be a signing. I'll just say that afterward at the vendor's thing. Uh, but the book is available uh, in print uh, or as a PDF file from Google Books, but not for pads uh, or Kindles. Uh, Jan kept us honest. We were drawing all of the organizational charts and communication systems because he would say, no, this one doesn't talk to that one. He talks to the to that one, and so we had it all documented and correct. Steve arranged for uh, a million permissions and didn't include the pictures for which we couldn't. It's full of photographs of people and things. So that's what the book is. Uh, we're proud of it. We're proud of it, and I can speak of it with such pride because it was everybody else's work that made it such uh, a splendid achievement. First, let's start with what a UFO is not. Tabloid, UFO fires on Louisville, Kentucky, police chopper, two cops survive. That is not what we mean by the word UFO. People project what they think we mean onto it, aliens, this and that. That's not what we mean. We mean an unidentified flying object. But to our knowledge, they did not fire on Louisville, Kentucky, police choppers. And to our knowledge, as this man claimed, space aliens drained my blood, then filled my veins with a mysterious yellow fluid, says shaken steel worker. Indeed, a steel worker or any of us would be shaken by having their blood drained and replaced with a yellow fluid, especially if it's a mysterious yellow fluid, the purpose of which we just do not know. <laughs> and if it was done by aliens, and on top of it, an alien that looked like that sketch, which was made from his description, uh, shaken is just the beginning of our response to that experience. <laughs> right? Uh, so the poor steel worker probably lives in Akron, Ohio to this day and will tell you his story. Uh, but that isn't what we mean by UFOs. Unfortunately, we don't mean this either. This was a great picture from Paul Trent, a farmer in McMinnville, Oregon. It looked like it was pretty credible. He took two pictures uh, around 1950-ish, late 40s, of this object, he said, which appeared over his farm. And he took two of them, and I'll show you both of them. And they looked pretty good. And the debunkers did everything they could to show that it was false, and they couldn't falsify it. And then, the number of pages and work and effort de dedicated to it was extraordinary. That's the first of two photos. This is a few newspaper clippings, and what you see in the sky are photo one on the right, photo two on the left, tilted differently on the left, and you can see that it had that kind of protuberance on the top. And he was just a farmer, and I talked to the people, actually, you go to great lengths to find out what's true. I talked to the people who buried him and knew him all his life. They said, no, he always said that this is what he had seen, this is what he photographed. 
Uh, and then this came in from Rouen, France. First it was said 54, then 57. Uh, and when you're following the provenance of a photo, because we want to th reject everything that can't be documented clearly and verified for accuracy, uh, different dates, no one came forward as they would have had this picture been taken by gun camera footage uh, from a jet uh, from the French. And it looks strikingly like, if you remember what the picture looks like, the Trent photo. In fact, what it looks like is the Trent photo, which someone has adjusted and changed a little bit in terms of perspective, but it's the same photo. It's not a separate photo, and there's no provenance for it, and that's not what we mean by UFO. That is, things that seem to be false are not what we mean by UFOs, and I just spent time only 10 days ago here in Vegas with Francois Louange, a wonderful man from France. Uh, if you saw Close Encounters of the Third Kind, he was like the Truffaut character. Uh, he worked with JEPON, the official French organization that was dedicated to understanding and responding to the UFO phenomena from the top down. He helped resuscitate it as JEPON in 2006, and he also worked with their spy satellite imagery programs for many years. He's no slouch, and now as a consultant, he developed a program for photo analysis, and he demonstrated to me painstakingly that the closer you get to that photo, that one, the pixels begin to change, and though the filament cannot be discerned on the photo, you can see that there is a filament there, better than two sigmas, greater probability than not, that it is hanging by a very thin invisible filament from that power line, and that's just too damn bad, because it's a great picture and a great story, and that's not, therefore, what we mean by UFO. But we do mean this. Coast Guard man, Salem, Massachusetts, 1952, he's in his office, he looks out the window, he sees that. He sees that and he takes his camera and he takes this picture. He also shows a photograph which was published as news, to which I will refer shortly, as news in the newspaper, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena East Coast, the newspapers reported it as news. Why? Because this is big news. When four vehicles in echelon formation are speeding through the sky, surrounded by what looks like a plasma. And in fact, we'll say a little more about that later. This is what we mean by a UFO. We mean a genuine photograph of objects flying in echelon formation, demonstrating aerodynamic characteristics and physical characteristics, which at the time the picture was taken or the report was made, could not be easily duplicated or in fact duplicated at all by any of us uh, terrestrials. Now I'm not saying it's extraterrestrial, I'm just saying we didn't know how to do that. We didn't know how to go from zero to a thousand at a talk I gave at the Random Lake Little Public Library. 88-year-old man sitting in back says, you know, I was in Korea running radar, and I saw these things come across our screen at 1,000 miles an hour. And I called my superior officer, I said, should I report this? And he said, no, 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 the radar is malfunctioning. He said, oh, then we should fix the radar. And the response was, no. So that was the end of that. <laughs> uh, so that's what you run into. Okay, so that's what a UFO is, and this is what a UFO is. The modern era began in the 1940s with Foo Fighters. The French word for fire is Foo, F-E-U. I can't say it right, but it's Foo for Americans. And these glowing objects, you see three arrows in the top picture and no arrows, but two glowing globular objects were widely reported from the German and Japanese theaters as pacing, trailing, following, and then taking off from the planes they paced or followed at an extraordinary rate of speed and going straight up or disappearing horizontally in the distance. And they glowed red and white like the plasmas that had become so familiar to ufology, and we didn't know what they were. Now, the military said it did not make any official response, but of course, using Freedom of Information Act and other sources in archives and libraries and correspondence, we have gotten the information that, in fact, they did. They were very concerned about what these were. We thought they were German or Japanese because we were flying missions over Germany and over Japan. We learned after the war because we got most of the scientists and turned them from bad Nazis into good Americans, like Werner von Braun. Uh, some became bad communists, which a bad Nazi would do. Uh, <laughs> But the best of them, including Werner von Braun, became our good American. Uh, anyway, we found out Germans didn't have them. They were as puzzled by them as we were. And we got all the troves of documents, so did the Russians. They didn't know what they were either. Neither did the Japanese. And so there was a military response, at least commanders writing to others saying, escalate the hypothesis. 
in order to understand what these are, and all they could think of was the category, the cognitive category, military operation against us by an enemy. Well, this continued. Uh, 1947 is when we mark the beginning of, quote, the modern uf ufological era, because that's when Kenneth Arnold, in, uh, in Washington, east of the mountains, uh, reported that what he saw were nine silvery objects flying in a kind of skipping motion through the sky behind peaks and then out in front again. And when he landed, he said they skipped through the air like saucers, which good reporters reported as he said they were saucers. And then we had the word flying saucer, which came into our lexicon. He actually said they were heel shaped with a straight edge uh, and then a rounded edge. But it was reported flying saucers because he said they skipped through the air like saucers. There were other reports all over the country in small local newspapers of sightings of discs and cigar-shaped objects and other kinds of objects that were flying and incredible and seemed strange and didn't make sense to us in 46 and 47. And it compelled the attention of the military. So we have this memo from Lieutenant General Nathan Twining to a general, George Shogun, I want to underscore some words. He said, it is the opinion that the phenomena reported is something real and not visionary or fictitious. Underscore real, not visionary, not fictitious. This is early on. They knew it was real. Why? Because not only people but sensors like radar detected the objects in a consistent way which showed consistent characteristics and because credible people, as we'll hear in a minute, saw what they called incredible things. They knew it was real. That's the basis. The sociological puzzle and the psychological puzzle for the rest of the 20th century is how we humans can hear this being said in the 1940s, they are real, the general said. They are real, the general said. And it does not penetrate our brain, even drip, 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 in any meaningful way so as to become the cornerstone or a foundational anomaly that is a fact, which Richard Feynman, the great physicist, said is where you begin to change the paradigm. It has to be a fact and it has to be anomalous. That is, it cannot fit in our current model of understanding. It was anomalous, we didn't know what they were, and it was a fact. There are objects properly approximating the shape of a disk of such size as to appear to be as large as man-made aircraft. The reported operating characteristics, which are very important, extreme rates of climb, maneuverability, and action which must be considered evasive when sighted by aircraft and radar. It was serious and it was taken seriously. The aerodynamic capability of the objects was reported to be far in excess of anything that we knew how to do or could engineer, even though we may well have been working on trying to understand electromagnetic systems or propulsion systems that didn't just blow gas out of the back end of an object and push it forward in response with lift. They operated in a different way, and our observations confirmed that, and we didn't know, and I don't think we still know exactly how gravity was displaced or electromagnetic currents were generated that affected space-time and affected the people who were close to the object in the way that they had been reported to do. So, they were real. Even Lyndon Johnson, who was a congressman then, he said, what's the story? I'm getting letters from constituents who see these things. And he was told correctly, this is one half of the quote that's in the book, you get that I'm just skipping through the highlights of 600 pages of well-documented, uh, complex, detailed history. We're investigating the flying disks. Detailed statements of credible witnesses are being carefully reviewed. Underscore credible witnesses. They knew then that's what they were, and they were being carefully reviewed, although not in public. Well, they had to respond, and they did. They formed Project Sign in 1948. There were three hypotheses considered by Project Sign, which was staffed by people who were well-intended and thought their, their commission, their task, was to try to come up with a hypothesis that best fit the data they were presented uh, and said what these things were likely to be. And there were three major hypotheses. They were Russian, uh, they were American, and a compartmented secret project that other people didn't know about or have a need to know about, or as they thought, extraterrestrial. These days, people will say, well, maybe they're from another universe or another dimension, and some of the behaviors, well, I won't go into that. This talk isn't about their behaviors. Uh, but today, we would expand on that and say, there are a variety of possibilities that might explain this if they are intelligent and if they are visitors. But at that time, it was Russian or American or extraterrestrial. Well, the Russians were not overflying our cities and our missile bases and our um, airports. They really weren't. 
They couldn't. Uh, they would have been in big trouble had they done that. If it was an American project, well, let's flash forward a few decades when Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14, who walked on the moon, said to me with a very straight face, Richard, he said, if we could do what they can do, they would not have sent me to the moon in a tin lizzy. Now, this is a man who spent several days cramped up in a tin can, going to the moon, walking on the moon, and who coming back had a life-changing experience in which he determined, uh, perceived, experienced the unity of all things, the interconnectedness, the non-local connectedness and consciousness of all things, and he's devoted his life ever after to trying to articulate that uh, so people could, very frustrating, very lonely, so people could understand what he experienced when he saw the unity of all things like a mystic coming back from the moon. Uh, they wouldn't have sent me to the moon in a tin lizzy if we knew how to move like that, he said. So it was determined that they were not American, to make the story very short. It was not a compartmented project, and we did not have the technological ability to do that. So the third hypothesis was the most likely, the least unlikely hypothesis that explains what we are looking at as data and evidence is the extraterrestrial hypothesis. They wrote an estimate of the situation, which is what you did in that domain, and sent it up the chain of command to Hoyt Vandenberg, the general at the top. He responded appropriately by saying, I refuse to accept that. Knocked it back down, it went back down the chain of command, Project Sign was disbanded, but they had to do something more, so they did Project Grudge, the name of which signifies the attitude of the people in it, who now knew clearly, because when your commanding officer says, I refuse to accept the likely hypothesis that explains the data, then you know your task is to come up with a hypothesis that is probably much less accurate than that, and therefore just spin your wheels, kill time, have lunch, take long naps, and come up with something. <laughs> well, we don't have the estimate of the situation. There is one copy. It's, it's kind of like the end of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's hidden in a warehouse somewhere. But we do have the report of uh, Ruppelt, Captain Ruppelt, uh, who was one of the first, the first head of Project Blue Book later on, uh, that it existed and what was in it. And it was that hypothesis, and that's what was rejected. Well, Project Grudge had a different attitude, and they came up with this. Look at this press release. Evaluate it for yourself. We have investigated and evaluated blank. That is, whatever is reported to be occurring, and have found nothing of value which would change our previous estimates on the subject. You know, and we, did, we had Mimeo machines then, not digital. So you crank out this press release, distribute them to all people and bases, and when anyone reports anything like an unidentified flag object, fill in the blank with the name of the incident and say it's been investigated and it's nothing. That was just an expedient response. Some were unhappy, like General Cable. He said, what the hell do I have to do? Actually, he said, what do I have to do? to stir up action. Anyone can see we do not have a satisfactory answer to the Saucer question. I want an answer and I want a good answer. In other words, the government is not just one thing. There were people who looked at the data and knew it was real and not fictitious and had read the data and wanted an answer. And of course the problem was that they didn't have an answer. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know what it was doing or doing here. And above all, this is critical, they wanted to know if it was a threat. Because if it was a Russian thing, it was a threat. Well, it wasn't Russian, but is it invaders from Mars? Are they going to eat us? Is it Clateau come down to tell us to get rid of our nuclear weapons? Uh, you know, going to stop the roller coaster from going for 20 minutes to get the attention of Earth? It's not doing any of those things. What kind of a threat to our national security might this be? Post-World War II, Europe is in rubble. The Marshall Plan is being cranked up as a way to reconstitute Europe. You guys are kids and don't remember that Europe was destroyed by World War II. It was like Syria today. And the Russians were cranking up the Cold War. We were engaged in a new kind of battle. The Iron Curtain had descended across Europe, et cetera, et cetera. In the light of those concerns and the paranoia and anti-communistic, not just paranoia, but realistic concerns that we had in those years, whether or not an aerial phenomena of this sort was a threat was a very important thing, and it was primarily what they looked at. What is the national security evaluation of this phenomena and these incidents? Well, some still claim they were a mirage, but let's flash forward again, skipping ahead, 1952, uh, a significant year. Uh, do you fire on a mirage? Do you fire on a hallucination? Quote, we quote, 
we have quotes around and footnotes and documentation for every damn thing in the book. There is nothing speculative. It's from the government's own documents that for 50 years, this dedicated, one would say, obsessive, compulsive team. And, and do you know anyone who's interesting who's not obsessive? Certainly not in this con, right? Uh, 52, at a distance of 130 miles, the quote goes, northeast of Washington, D.C., relevant. In a minute, three different Army radar units detected an object at 18,000 feet. Strong signal, not an inversion, not a bogey, not a blip that wasn't explained. It remained stationary on radar for 30 minutes and then began to move, and by the time it reached the end of the scope, as I alluded, it was going 1,000 miles an hour. Our report went all the way to the Pentagon, and the order came back. If another came in, fire on it. After that first night, we loaded our 99mm anti-aircraft guns. Unusual to do in a populated area. You don't hear them going off over Nellis right now or over downtown Las Vegas or the Strip. We don't fire those kind of guns over populated areas at nothing. We scrambled F-94 jet fighters from McGuire Air Force Base. They didn't see them again. They didn't fire. But they were ready to engage in combat not with a fictitious object, but with a threatening object, because it invaded the airspace which the Air Force was commissioned to protect and defend on behalf of the American people, and it had a lot of investment in having done so during World War II to an extraordinary degree. So this was really a threat and a challenge to everything, to groupthink, to ego, to institutional mentality, everything legitimate and maybe not as legitimate as well. But I said that was June 1952, in July, Washington, D.C., very famous in the in cycle. Eight days over Washington, D.C., so many objects appeared so often, they were seen by multiple pilots, they were seen by multiple witnesses on the ground, and they were tracked by the air traffic control stations on radar in multiple ways. So multiple witnesses all correlated to the same points and the same objects, and fighters were scrambled and chased them and couldn't catch them. Except one poor guy who was chasing one, and then instead of fleeing, as they do, they just play cat and mouse, it came back toward him. And when he looked around, another one was coming back toward him from this side, another here. And when you look at the radar screen that is replicated by the transmission, by the transcript of the conversation with the air traffic controller, you see his blip here, and you see a circle of closing blips around him, and he said the equivalent of, holy uh, smokes, what... <laughs> um, how do I get out of here? Well, they... They, if there was a they, something hurt it too because then the blips parted. And there were multiple witnesses to this event. And General Samford said at a press conference before they decided the whole thing of eight days duration was an inversion, a weather inversion, uh, despite the contrary indications from meteorologists. He said credible people have seen incredible things. And it was news still, 52. That's the front page of the Washington Post. Can you imagine that today? The Washington Post, the New York Times, saucer outran jet, not pilot speculates, pilot hopes, pilot thinks, pilot reveals. He chased it, and it flew away so fast he couldn't catch it. I could show you numerous clippings. We have literally thousands of clippings that we have painstakingly gathered from around the country, from old periodicals as well as other archives that, in this case, there are many about this week New York Times, other papers carried it as news because an investigation had to be on in secret after the chase over the Capitol. So it was news, and it was big news, and that was important. So they had to do something in response to this. They created Project Blue Book. These things were over the Capitol. They were over the White House. Uh, they didn't land at the White House, but they were over the White House. And they hired Dr. Alan Hynek from Northwestern University, famous astronomer, to be the resource for Project Blue Book. And the CIA got involved and concluded a study, listen to these words carefully, because they signify what we document in greater complexity and detail, a direction that subsequently was followed after the Robertson panel met, convened Air Force uh, and CIA people in 1953, and decided on a plan of response that made sense to them, and it kind of went aligned with this. Flying saucers are not a threat to national security. They didn't say they're not real. They said they're not attacking, they're not a threat, they fly around. What is a threat to national security? Reports of flying saucers are. Therefore, military personnel should be trained in proper observation of flying saucers. Now, at this point, we can speculate and ask the question, why should they be trained? Well, because if there's something... 10 minutes, 
You give me a break. You're not kidding. Okay. You think I was talking fast before? <laughs> uh, look at them. Learn everything you can from them. Figure out what they are if you can. Figure out how to reverse engineer them. Do research and development along the lines that many DARPA programs seem somehow, but that's all speculative, to have followed in order to find a way to move like that. Uh, and also at the same time create programs to debunk flying saucers to the citizenry. And there you have it. Uh, there you have it. Ellen Hynek said it's characterized by a constant flow of reports. This is later. I'm jumping ahead, as I need to now. Uh, these are from highly responsible people. Either something strange is going around, or, I, or I'm going to have to call all these people liars. If there are independent witnesses, you have a quite, quite a job proving they're all hallucinated. Heineck began a skeptic, and as the reports came in, and as he did on-the-ground investigations in detail, like with Father McGill in Papua New Guinea, an extraordinary case, uh, or uh, Lenny Zamora uh, in Socorro, New Mexico, an extraordinary case, he came increasingly to be convinced exactly what he says here. These people are not lying. They're not crazy. Uh, something's going on. And it's global. 150 countries. It is global. It is reports in the same level of detail, same idiosyncratic detail, same granular detail from all over the world. And as a friend of mine at NSA who wrote a paper that was disseminated through the agency said, what's funny in America is not funny everywhere. What's funny for one year isn't funny for 50. And they agree in the small details from all over the world. So 20 years later, when he became disgusted with the re realization that Project Blue Book was a public relations effort designed to placate and cover whatever was really happening. Uh, in other words, with the least untruthful things one could say while still lying in public, because that's simply the nature of cover and deception. I'm not saying something uh, controversial there. That's how it's done. It's not a conspiracy. It's policy. And the people who form the policy, yes, they meet in rooms. But it doesn't mean I'm a conspiracy theorist or they're conspirators. It's the nature of the national security state with the degree of secrecy that we have now and the high degree of classification and the necessity, therefore, when something is believed that it should be covered appropriately, and a lot of people think they made the right decisions to decide this in light of national security concerns, then you do say the least untruthful thing you can say in public while still maintaining the cover story. But this is what it does to the public, and that's why people are so uh, disoriented by the revelations about what we are doing at a government level. The public, he said, was placed in the role of the enemy against whom counter-espionage tactics must be employed. From my experience, I felt those in charge considered people who reported or took a serious interest in the U.S. Office and just wanted to know about them, like me, schmucks like me, what's going on on the planet. They were enemies. Just as today, it is very difficult to distinguish patriots from whistleblowers, from terrorists, from religious zealots, from concerned citizens, from journalists. They all behave the same way. It is allegiance, perceived allegiance, that determines whether or not they're an enemy. A hacker is simply a hacker. I mean, I've defined it correctly, I think. A black hat hacker um, is a hacker who knows when to lie. Um, a, a gray hat hacker uh, is a hacker who knows when it's appropriate to, well, fudge the truth. A white hat hacker is a hacker who put the truth down somewhere and can't remember where he left it. You know? <laughs> it's just what it is. So what is a UFO? Um, have to do this quick. Herman Oberth. Von Braun, who I mentioned, for this reason, his mentor in rocketry looked at, he says here, not three or four, but 50 radar measurements from Air Force and Navy jets. These are from handwritten notes that we have from a lecture Oberth gave in Germany. They can't all be so inaccurate. What was he talking about that he said was legitimate? He was speaking of extraordinary speeds and maneuvers. And if you ask what those were, he said they fly in this way. You can look at the details later. Uh, in sunlight, which is brighter than the objects themselves, they glitter like metal. They're dark orange and cherry red at night. 
if they don't need much power. When they're suspended, that is hovering, then they don't shine much. But if they start really moving, shining brightens. They turn yellow, yellow, green, green like a copper flame, and in a state of highest speed or acceleration, extremely white. Is that arcane or mysterious? No, according to Paul Hill, who wrote a wonderful book. He was at NASA for many decades. He was fascinated by UFOs, having had his own sightings. He was allowed to collect whatever data and information and stories he could, undercover because NASA's official position is we don't investigate them and they don't exist anyway. But he was allowed to do that and his book was published by his daughter Julie posthumously as Unconventional Flying Objects, a scientific analysis in which he spells out as best he could with his limited ability but supreme knowledge the physics of what had been observed by him and by others. Five minutes. Okay. And in the chapter on illumination, he correlates photon energy with the corresponding colors exactly as Oberth described, exactly as many, many people have described from clear observation. They come from energetic ionizing radiation generated by the UFO, which ionizes the air, red and orange, the least energy, as you just heard, then blue, blue and white, white and blue, corresponds to strong radiation peak, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, people are corroborating and correlating data, and they are making sense of the same thing. During the 1950s, Project Blue Book always explained away everything except those it couldn't. And then those were listed as unexplained and treated separately, as if they didn't count. The Air Force has a wonderful manual that it issued in the 1970s to the Air Force cadets at the, universe, at the United States Air Force Academy. It had one chapter on UFOs. About half of it was cases of unexplained, unidentified objects. And they made the statement in the discussion section and I'm paraphrasing, but this is what they said. The uncorrelated data strongly suggests that we are being visited by three or four civilizations. Let that in. And then when people got wind of this chapter, somebody was realized to have made a mistake. The book was retracted. All were pulped. A new edition was issued. The last chapter was rewritten. All the cases were removed, and the statement was made there's nothing to it. But we think it's interesting for cadets to consider anomalies because it challenges their thinking. But they said three to four civilizations are likely visiting based on reports. But there are other cases like the RB-47 bomber, uh, numerous events in the 70s, a wave prompted uh, a need to have it done scientifically, and the Air Force was sick of this because it couldn't deal with it. And they appointed the Condon Committee at the University of Colorado, our biggest and one, one of the best chapters in this book is the detailed work Mike Swords, the expert on the Condon Committee, has done to show the politics of how that reached its conclusion. I have to jump ahead to the conclusion. 1,500 page work, including numerous cases who were unexplained and unidentified, and then one chapter, the only chapter Condon wrote without consulting his own 1,500 pages of work by his committee and without doing any of the field investigation in which he concluded there was nothing to it and no reason to be investigating them any further. And the Air Force, as intended, heaved a sigh of relief and said, we're out of the business of UFOs. They are not going to investigate anything anymore. And you'll get a boilerplate letter from them if you report something. We don't do this. Call your police. However, Barry Greenwood, using FOIA, found out they were very much interested in what was going on across the northern tier of the country in the 70s, like the Minot Air Force Base, which is on the web. Tom Tulina, Minneapolis, has done an incredible presentation documenting and detailing what happened at Minot. Loring Air Force Base, they said nothing happened, but Freedom of Information Act got 24 documents describing, indeed, that something happened. And across the whole northern tier, from Pease all the way to Malmstrom in Montana, remarkable events took place to which I merely allude and encourage you to do your own thinking and do your own research and find out what was going on because the manner of dealing with it was to debunk, to ridicule, and demean. How did they do it? How did they do it? Uh, a friend of mine at NSA teaches on deception. It's the three legs to the stool. Illusions, create illusions that people believe are real and reinforce them through media amplification. <coughs> create distractions, uh, misdirection, like a magician. If somebody sees something, well, all right, it's there, but I'll just make them look over here. A friend of mine who I met here works at NSA as a contract employee looked for correlation between scandals among celebrities and important events that needed to be hidden in newspapers, he found a better than chance correlation. It troubled him. Why was poor Paris Hilton let out of jail early? And then he looked and found something about Iraq on page 22. Paris Hilton was the headline. Now, it's not that simple and that easy, but the media is complicit at best, or at worst, cooperative at best, complicit at worst, in amplifying 
whatever it needs to amplify, according to the people who feed stories. And that's a whole other talk that I'd love to do sometime on how we appointed ourselves the Ministry of Culture, the CIA did in the 50s and 60s, and what they did around the world with the wholesale creation of newspapers, magazines, and periodicals in order to make them look independent so that different points of view could be uh, articulated and then magnified and then repeated by other magazines, which they also influenced their own. Um, things are not what they seem. They really are not what they seem, and that too is documented. Other cases continue to refer you to the Tehran case. We have a document from the Defense Intelligence Agency describing the dogfight. It's uh, fascinating reading. The big Alaska airship uh, is also fascinating. You're about to tell me that I'm almost, almost done. <laughs> okay. It's recommended for inclusion in university libraries because it's an exception. A thousand citations, 600 pages, the history of the government's response. We don't say anything about aliens or origins, but we do think you're smart. And if you see the nose of a camel inside your tent, guess what might be attached to it outside the tent? Read this book and other credible work, which is referred to on my website. If you're interested in seeing the book or purchasing one, come to the book signing over in the book vendor space at... Uh, Breakpoint Books, um, and take a look at the book. And we're not doing Q&A rooms anymore, but I have business cards. Anybody who wants to contact me, talk about this or any of the other things I've done or said for 18 years, which is a lot, take a book. It's a website is themeworks.com. Contact me. I belong to you. My life is an open book, kind of. And I'll <laughs> be glad to talk about this or any of the other relevant details. Thank you. Thank you.